All right, um, as we transition now, I wanted to uh, talk about communion. I wanted to talk about the power in communion. And last week, Viv spoke powerfully, didn't she? It was powerful and deep. And if you haven't listened to that or watched that, please go ahead and do that. If you have watched it or if you have listened, please go ahead and do that again. And we, she was talking about cultivating. What are we sowing in order to reap? And uh, for those of us who, who may have seen her last week, we, we planted uh, some seeds. Uh, they're still in there. <laughs> they're still waiting to come alive. And, uh, but, <laughs> but it was powerful and moving. Uh, for Viv and I, we've been deeply encouraged and deeply uh, moved by the community at this time. We've never had, over the last five, six weeks, we've never had so many encouraging texts, emails, uh, anonymous letters, cards to us, which are just really encouraging us. Uh, for many of us, we've never worked so hard. Um, I'm, I feel like I'm double as busy, and, uh, and yet I've, I've not taken time out to just deeply receive and know that encouragement can fuel me as a person and you as a person. You see, the word encouragement literally means, its root word is to place courage into someone else. And uh, let's be honest, we could all do with uh, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. And so we've just appreciated all the, all the kind words and messages that, that you've been sending us. It helps us to keep going. You know, we're here, we're trying to create an environment where God can meet with you, God can minister to you, environments where you can connect with other people. But actually, we feel like we're more encouraged now there than in any other season. So just really, really appreciate, really appreciate your, your kind words to us. What we've been finding is that we're creating new language, new declarations, new phrases for this season as we try to release faith into ourselves, but also as a community. Uh, I had this one uh, declaration, one phrase that I just wanted to share with you. It's been really helpful for me the last sort of seven, 10 days. Uh, I am having a normal response to an abnormal situation. We've never faced a global pandemic. Just say this with me. I am having a normal response to an abnormal situation. How your body is reacting at this time is normal to an abnormal situation. Um, a few weeks ago, I talked about breath prayers and breathing. Uh, one of the things I've also been breathing, as I breathe in, I've been saying, I can't. And I've been breathing out, Jesus, you can. I want you to do that right now. Just breathe in and just say, I can't. I can't. And then breathe out, Jesus, you can. Jesus, you can. Um, right now, many of us are hitting our limits. Uh, we're impatient. I'm noting we're impatient for the government to, to tell us when, when are we allowed to be let loose? You know, it feels like a, a dog in a cage. When can I go? When can I go? Um, it's helpful at the moment to keep breathing daily, to keep breathing deeply. You obviously need to breathe daily, otherwise you'll die. But keep breathing deeply. <laughs> And have some declarations that you can meditate on. Have some truths that you can meditate on. Grab a Bible and dive deep into these truths that are, are in the Scriptures. You see, uh, what we're discovering is it's not up to us. Some of the questions are, can you depend on Christ in this season? Can you cast your cares onto him? Uh, you see, our Western, secular, humanistic culture is, is telling us it's all about you. It's all about me. It's all about my virtue, my achievement. This is a time where we can die to all of that. We can die to that pool. You see, God might be wanting to wean us off our self-reliance. As we come to the limit on our emotional or spiritual capacity... We now only have Jesus who we can rely on. I love it in John, John, John 6 where, where Jesus, uh, some of the other disciples and followers are leaving Jesus at the time. And he says to his disciples, 
do you guys want to go as well? And Peter, just tur- Peter the apostle just turns to him and says, where else would we go? You are the one, you hold the words of eternal life. And I love that, just as we try and die to ourselves and die to this pool in our, our Western culture, we only have Jesus. So the, the, the prayer that Jesus taught us is our Father in heaven. But I love that line, give us today our daily bread. I've been praying that more and more and more. Jesus, give me what I need today. Give me what I need today. And so our message really has been, um, let's not end up in the same place we were before lockdown. Can we use this time to cultivate habits, spiritual formation? Can we increase our emotional intelligence? Can we deepen our apprenticeship to Jesus? So today, I want to potentially look at one of the most powerful way, powerful ways we can do all of this in one go. How can we create some habits? How can we increase our emotional intelligence? How can we deepen our apprenticeship to, deep, to Jesus? How, how can we invest in spiritual formation? And I'm attempting to try and do this in one go. You see, if someone t- was to ask you, you're, you're outside a supermarket, you're two meters away, you're maintaining social distancing, someone turns around and they see the cross around your neck, or for many of you, you've got this glow, this holy glow around you, and they see something of Christ in you. And uh, they turn around and they say, Tell me about Christianity. What's the central emphasis of Christianity? I mean, boil it down. Make it really simple for me. Is there one thing that this man Jesus, or the heart of what Jesus taught, what he modeled and accomplished, is there one thing that I can discover from Christianity? I don't know about you. How would you answer that question? I don't know how you'd answer that question. They might say, what is the single greatest contribution to the Christian faith, to the, to the well-being of the world. Uh, and it's one of those scenes, I imagine, where you're, you're just flying in all kinds of different, different ways. You could answer them and say, you know, without unbiased evaluation, the Christian contribution to the world, we would acknowledge that Christians have been at the forefront of establishing healthcare. You see, Christians started the first Uh, the world's first hospitals, the relief agencies, clinics. Uh, Christian missionaries were often known as having, in one hand, a Bible in one hand, and on the other hand, they would be carrying a bag of medicine in the other. So we could talk about that. Or we could talk about the Christian contribution to education and to literacy. You see, the Christians founded the world's best universities, such as Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, and, and on and on. So we could talk about education, or we could talk about the arts, or the music, or to literature. We could talk about the birth of modern science. We could then talk about the Christians' involvement in modern democracy, or the foundation of the modern civil rights movement. We could just talk about that. Here in the UK, we could talk about the welfare state. Uh, Back in, uh, just after the war, the foundation of the welfare state or just two miles away from here, we could talk about William Wilberforce and the Clapham sect that abolished slavery in its time. The list goes on and on and on. What would you say? I could talk about the role of the church in the UK. It's worth about three billion pound in time and resources every year to the UK to support those in need. But let me just say this. I would push all of those to one side. I would just say they are nothing compared to this one thing. If I were to ask you, what is the one thing, the single most greatest achievement, the most fundamental thing that Christianity has brought to the world, I believe you should answer that person in in Sainsbury's, or yourself, with the word forgiveness. Now, I'm unable to do this at the moment because I've got a marker on my chair, uh, on on the floor, I would want to come and look at each of you in the eye and come and join you and just say, Esther, it's forgiveness. Karen, it's forgiveness. Matt, it's forgiveness. Josiah, it's forgiveness. Jono, it's forgiveness. Sarah, it's forgiveness. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it's forgiveness. I would want to like, look at you in the eye and say the greatest thing that Christianity has done for you is forgiveness. 
but I can't because I'm, I'm on this gray marker and I'm not allowed to move, otherwise Will will shout at me. <laughs> um, I just want to speak to some of the, uh, some of the Christians who are, who are tuning in and just say sometimes it's really hard. I know for my own life, it's really hard to hear the voice of God saying you're forgiven. Sometimes it's really hard to hear the voice of God saying you're forgiven, which I think is crazy. Sometimes we can be Christians, but never hear the voice of God saying, I forgive you. Often we'll come to God with a whole list of things, or we'll spend time in worship, or we'll uh, come to our prayer meeting, and, uh, but we never wait long enough for God to say, I forgive you. And so that's what we're going to do through this communion. My hope, my hope this morning is that we'll learn to see communion as less kind of bewildering, but more transformational. It's more transformational for your soul, the things that you're cultivating at the moment. I want to propose that communion could be a powerful um, nurture for your soul or for your soil. My hope is that we would share together this great celebration of Jesus' love that comes from the gift of his freedom and forgiveness. What I want to, what I want to say is don't wait till, you're, till you understand enough what it means to follow Jesus, to then do communion. Simply recognize that you are loved, you are forgiven, and you are welcome to the Lord's table. And so we're going to read from Matthew 26. Uh, from verse, I think, 26 to, to 30. The, the words are going to come up on the screen. Can I just say thank you for the scriptures, Jesus? Thank you, God, that you, cr you release the, the scriptures to us. And I pray in reading the scriptures that we would understand you more, more deeply and you'd be more known to us. Okay, so Matthew 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples. Take and eat, he said. This is my body. Then he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them. Drink this, all of you, he said. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But let me tell you this. I will not drink any more from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you, in the kingdom of my father. I love this bit. They sang a hymn and went to the Mount of Olives. This is the word of God. It's absolutely true. And it was given to you and me in love. So as I said, in a few minutes, we're going to partake in communion. So you might want to go ahead and grab, whether you've got some bread, gluten-free bread, crackers, pita, or you might just want to grab some wine, ribena, or some juice. I want to say communion is not a ritual to be observed, but it's a blessing to be received by faith. And so in this passage, as we've just read, we see Jesus and his disciples celebrating Passover night before he then died on the cross. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about Passover because I think the Passover meal for many of us is really strange, even confusing as a ritual. For many of us, the Exodus story seems like some distant story, some weird act. You know, we, we, things, we hear things about the, the parting of the Dead Sea, and we think it's more akin to like an Avengers film or a Harry Potter than it is to modern life. However, for the disciples, the Passover meal was not unusual at all. It was simply this annual reminder of God's provision of freedom um, and promise of a greater freedom to come. And this greater freedom was a freedom from sin. And so here we are, the disciples and Jesus gathered around in the upper room. Uh, Jesus being their mentor would naturally have assumed the leadership role in this ceremony. But on this occasion, recorded in Matthew, uh, Jesus, he deviated from the familiar script that was known from, from their childhood up until, their, up until that moment. They would have done a familiar script and a familiar uh, ongoing uh, story through this Passover meal. But Jesus here, he deviates. He takes the script and he goes a different angle because he starts talking about himself. 
he took the whole meaning of Passover and applied it to himself and what he was about to do. He says, my body, my blood. And so he invites the disciples to respond. They were asked to take the same sacrament, but this time for a whole new reason. See, the symbolism changed in that moment. Or to be, if I can be more precise, Jesus was announcing that the symbolism, which had been in, in existence for thousands of years, was all pointing to this very moment in time. Uh, if I was in the room, uh, if I had been practicing this as, from childhood, I've, if I'd been religiously saying this Passover meal has to be done like this, I would probably turn to my, my friends and go, is this guy a joker? Is he for real? Is this really happening? I might go, is he saying what I think he's saying? I don't know about you, how would you feel if you were in that room as well? You see, the, the message of Jesus, what he was saying on that Last Supper, on one hand, is really simple. It's about the bread and the wine and remembering. But yet on another level, its significance is monumental. This, Because what happened is this meal and the few days that followed were the pinnacle of God's great plan to restore you and me into a, a renewed and beautiful, beautiful relationship with the Father. And so this message of the Last Supper was that all previous Passover meals and celebrations were pointing to, to this time that we read in Matthew 28. You see, the Jews, as I said earlier, they, the Jews believed that the Passover meal didn't just commemorate the Exodus as a historical event, but also a future event would God, when God would give freedom for all people for all their sin. The Passover meal looked towards a time when God would forgive people and the whole world once and for all. And Jesus, in the greatest mic drop ever, the greatest mic drop ever, he was saying, now is the time you've been waiting for. This is the moment you've been waiting for, for thousands of years. He's saying, freedom from sin can only be found in me. And so when we practice communion, we just use this symbolic language, language to remember, to thank, to praise God for what he's already done and what he has promised he will do to complete. I really believe communion is this powerful, glorious act of recognition. Because again, we're so flawed that we need Jesus to come and rescue us. And we're so loved that he cho chose to die for us. Okay, so why bread and wine? I was thinking about this last night. Just um, how do you get bread? And many of you, I've been seeing you all on Instagram baking and making bread, and I've been, sh been shopping, and there's no flour, self-raising flour, because you lot are all baking bread. So we can't bake bread. Um, but how do, you get bre how do you get bread? What you don't do is you take the barley and the wheat, and you kind of spread some butter on, and you go, Mwah. Oh, that's the greatest sourdough bread I've ever had. You don't do that. How do you make bread? With bread, you have to crush it. You have to sieve it. You have to pound the dough, don't you? You then have to burn it. You have to put it into an oven. Because it all speaks of suffering. All of this speaks of suffering. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of me shall never hunger. And then I was thinking about wine. How do you get wine? You don't just pluck a grape and try and get all the juices out. And you go, oh, the finest Argentinian Merlot. You don't, that's not how you get wine. I've, I don't know about you. I've never seen anyone get drunk on grapes. The, you know, you don't go, these grapes are so fermented. I can feel all the texture. No, how do you get wine? You crush it, you pierce it, you have to skin it, you have to step on it, then you have to leave it in the dark for it to get fermented. You see, all that happened to, Je to Jesus. He was left in the dark so that he could become new wine for you and I. Isaiah uh, is a prophet in the Old Testament, and he prophesied, he was a prophet that would prophesy about this coming Messiah 
And he said this about Jesus. In Isaiah 53, he said, Surely he took on our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, struck down and afflicted. Listen to this word. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Like all sheep have gone astray, each one has turned to his own way, own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of, of us all. So the symbolism is there. That's why we partake in the bread and wine. Uh, and it doesn't matter where, if it's grape juice or whatever. It's not the substance that heals you. It's not the substance that forgives you. The, the blessing is not in the, the, the bread or the wine. The blessing is when you partake by faith, when you remember that the body was broken for you and his blood was shed for you. So what, what I want you to do now is just go ahead and grab the bread or bread substitute that you have. <laughs> That's the only way I can have two hands. Um, what I want you to do is first hold the bread First, hold the bread in your hand, and I'm just going to pray, and at the end of my, my prayer, I want you to say, in Jesus' name, I believe and I receive. In Je I'm just getting instructions. In Jesus' name, I believe and I receive. So I'm going to pray. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son. By the stripes that fell on his back, my body is healed and our bodies are healed from the crown of our head to the very soles of our feet. And I declare every cell, every organ, every function of your body is healed, restored and renewed. And say this with me, in Jesus' name, I believe and I receive. Now, go ahead and take the bread, eat the bread. Now, take the cup. Um, I've got some juice in my hand. Take the cup, and uh, at the end of my prayer, I want you to say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me. Amen. As we take, take the wine, take the cup in your hand, we just say, thank you, Jesus, for your precious, precious blood. Your sin-free, disease-free, poverty-free life is in your blood. And your shed blood has removed every sin and shame from my life. Through your blood, I am forgiven of all my sins, past, present, and future, and made completely righteous. Today, I celebrate and partake in the inheritance of the righteous, which is preservation, healing, wholeness, and provision. Say this with me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving me. Amen. Go ahead. Now, in liturgical services, this moment now was one of the most important parts of the service. service. What I want you to do is just hold your hand out, because I'm going to declare something over you and I want you to receive it. Just put your hands like this. You might want to close your eyes. The Lord says, you are forgiven. He declares over you, I choose to forgive you. I choose to let you go. There is nothing that can separate you from my love.
me, I just keep, keep receiving. If we are indeed going to come out of this season better, let's get better at forgiveness. Let's get better at forgiving yourself. You know, and then Jesus says, now I want you to go and do the same. Let's get better at forgiving others. As I come to land and we, we go into a time of worship, my, my prayer for you right now is, is that you will learn to forgive yourself during the season. You will learn to forgive others. You will learn to take a moment and hear the voice of God say, I forgive you. I also want to propose over these next few weeks, maybe, just every day, uh, take communion as a sign to remember uh, that Christ alone is, is who we lean on, who, who we hope on. Um, we don't want to leave this space. We want to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you, uh, for him to take on your sin, your shame, and your burdens, and receive, receive the free gift of forgiveness that Jesus has for you. I love this uh, what Jesus says in Matthew 11, he says this great, great uh, phrase and line, which I wanted to just read to you. It might be just carry on receiving, just hear the voice of God uh, say this over you. Are you tired? This is Jesus speaking. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I will show you how to take real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn uh, to be free and to walk lightly. So Holy Spirit, just come. Keep ministering to individuals. And just right now, the Holy Spirit, he comes to comfort, he comes to convict, he comes to counsel, and he comes to lead you to Jesus. Allow him to minister to you now as we, as we move into a, to a song of worship and response. Mm -hmm.